to it. So the topic today for this particular message is a worst case scenario, prepping a Bible message or a lesson in an emergency setting. Now, maybe even announcing the title of this message just sent a little bit of cold sweat running down your back because there are a lot of people for whom giving any kind of public teaching would be the scariest thing that you could possibly face in your entire life. For others of you, you are old hat. You could do this tomorrow. No big deal. But what I want to do in this message is I want to run through with you a simple way that you could create a Bible message or devotion with fairly little time to prepare. So we're going to do kind of a bare bones style of how to prepare a message. But you could also take these principles that I'm going to give you and greatly elaborate them and create a fantastic full sermon with all kinds of illustrations and exegetical materials besides. You could easily do that with this basic formula here. So I'm assuming that all of us in our lives are going to face a couple of worst case scenario moments, whether you're chased by a bear or you find yourself fighting an anaconda anaconda in the Everglades. I'm not sure if that's ever going to happen to you, Dave, but if you do, you got to be ready for it, right? My mother, I doubt she's watching, but if she is, hello, mom. She is the worst case scenario guru. My mom is always warning me about everything that could possibly happen that is going to go bad or go wrong. So for instance, if I said in July, mom, I think I might come visit you this weekend, she would warn me about making sure to have a spare tire in case there's a snowstorm and blankets in the car. It's like, mom, it's July. We're not going to have a snowstorm. But my mom is always thinking in terms of worst case scenario. So when I say preparing a message or a devotion in a worst case scenario, let's just think about what that could be for a moment, all right? Especially for those of you here who are elders of the church, if it would ever be the case that uh, Pastor Matt gets the vomiting flu late on Saturday night and David is away because he's superintending a session meeting at some other church or something like that, it would be your default Bill, since you're one of the elders here in the room. Kevin, you're one of the elders in the room. Dave is an ordained elder in the PCA. So we would be coming to you for that message in that short-term scenario, even in the unlikely moment that you had to prepare one the night before, okay? Now, some of you are thinking, well, that's never going to happen to me. Well, maybe it is. You know, maybe uh, the youth group calls upon you to give a devotion for the young ladies ministry or something like that, Nikki, or maybe the the new mother's club is going to have somebody give an opening devotion for the women, for one who's just had a baby or a baby shower. All of us probably at some point will be called upon to say some words in an appropriate setting and scenario. And so what we're going to do today is I'm going to try to take you through the rudimentary basics of how you would go about preparing even a short devotion, could be five minutes, or a sermon, 45 minutes, using this particular construct that I'm going to show you through today. Now, before you say that that's ridiculous, that would never happen. Let me just remind you of the conversion story of Charles Spurgeon. If you haven't heard the story, it is a beautiful story. Spurgeon was a young man, and on the Lord's Day morning, he was going to go to his uh, regularly suited church, but there happened to be a terrible snowfall early that morning, and Spurgeon was unable to get by foot to the church that he was intending to, uh, to worship at. So he ducked inside a small Methodist chapel, And it happened to be that day that the pastor who was scheduled to preach was also waylaid by that snowstorm. And so uh, Spurgeon, having arrived, he found himself with just a very small gathering like we have here today, maybe 10 or 12 people. And it fell upon the deacon of that church, who was not a professionally trained orator or a regular speaker, to have to stand up and to give a sermon in lieu of the pastors being unable to come by way of providential hindrance. And so this deacon, he stood up and he pointed to a text in Isaiah, one verse, and the verse in Isaiah says, Look ye to the Lord and be saved, King James Version. And that deacon took that one verse and he made it into three points. Look. First, you must look. Okay. Second, to whom? To the Lord. Third, and be saved. And with that, he elaborated for just a couple of moments on each one of those three points in that one verse. And that short, probably 
seven to ten minute devotion is what the Lord used to open the heart of Charles Spurgeon, who ironically became what we call today as the Prince of Preachers. And so don't think that just because a message is slightly prepared or ill-prepared or prepared in an emergency that the Lord God couldn't use it very greatly. Uh, In fact, he has done that very many times. Now, hopefully you won't have five minutes to prepare something. But if you did, uh, what you would be trying to do, all biblical teaching, whether it's a sermon or a devotion or whatever it is, uh, opening prayer for the Cub Scout meeting, whatever whatever you got going on, uh, that's not really a devotion, but you get the idea. Three things that we're really striving for here. First, whatever we say, we want it to be biblical. Okay, so I'm going to teach you how to start with a text and to elaborate on that biblical passage for the edification of your particular audience. So we definitely want to say things that are biblical and scriptural and true. That's what we do. We're believers. We're Bible-believing Christians. David and I, we've got nothing on a Sunday morning if we don't come out of a, of a text and give exposition of it and try to apply it. We've got nothing. We're not creative. We're not fancy. We're not smart. We're not particularly genius or clever. We are only good in as much as we are biblical. So whatever else you do, you want to be biblical. You also, though, have to be intelligible, which means that you want what you say to be understood by the people. You can't speak way over their head, and you can't speak so far under their feet that it makes no sense to them, practically speaking. And so you're aiming at the general intellect of the average aggregate of your, of your audience on any given occasion. Okay? You're just aiming for the common folks. And then third, it has to be applicable and relevant to their lives. Okay? You may give the most doctrinally profound exposition of superlapsarianism, But if nobody knows what superlapsarianism is, uh, you might have just wasted everybody's time. They have to see somehow that this connects with their real life in some way, even if that way is to cause them to adore and to worship the great and living God with further and greater reverence and respect. So these are the goals that we're trying to establish in all Bible preaching, whether it's a small thing or or an elaborate message, biblical, intelligible, and applicable. So, How are we going to do it? You just got the call. Here comes the phone call. Ring, ring. It's Pastor Matt. He's sick. You're up tomorrow morning. You got 12 hours to prepare. Now you're going to have to stay up all night. What are you going to do? Okay. Well, the first thing you're going to do, this is step one, is you're going to choose a text. (laughs) You got to have something to say. Okay. There's nothing more fundamental than simply picking a passage of the Bible to, uh, to begin to operate out of. Otherwise, how are you going to organize your thoughts? So what we're going to do today is we're going to use, by way of example, Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to fabricate a message here. We're going to make something up as we go. We're going we're to crowdsource this, this message here together. So let's turn to Isaiah chapter 6. I, I picked a familiar text on purpose because it's just going to stand for our, our generic construct here. But this is a marvelous, marvelous passage, right? And this is one that probably you know. If you had to do an emergency sermon, starting with something you know is probably a great idea. No need to uh, try to find something new in the book of 2 Kings or something that you've never even studied before. Go to something you know, for the most part. And what is this passage about? Okay, so look at Isaiah chapter 6, and we're looking at verses 1 to 7. What would you say happens here? Anyone just shout out a couple of things that, uh, that you know about this text. What's going on here? All right. what? Yes, Isaiah has a vision. Great. There's the title of my sermon already. Isaiah has a vision. How about that? That sounds good. Uh, what happens in this vision? I'm going to start picking on people here. Bill, what, what happens in Isaiah 6? He sees the very throne room of God. Yeah, he sees the throne room of God. And he utters a, a very famous phrase here in verse 3. Dave Frenzel, what does he say? What does he hear said in verse 3? Yeah, yeah, he says that. And, and before that even, he hears the angel saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. Oh, oops, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I almost quoted Revelation there instead. Okay, so we're going to choose this as our text. We're gonna, just going to say this is the one we're going to use. And let's go ahead and build out a message from here. So now that we've selected our Bible passage, the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to work to understand the text. Because if I don't understand this Bible passage, I'm going to have a really hard time explaining it. You probably already know 
that if you ever try to get up and explain something you don't fully understand yourself, you're going to talk yourself into circles, you're probably going to confuse yourself, and you're definitely going to confuse your audience. Okay, so the first thing that we really want to do after we select a text is try to gain some mastery over the meaning of the text. Now, this is easier said than done, I know that, but uh, the most basic level, we're going to read and reread the passage until it begins to become clear in our own mind. Now, we may uh, apply some study tools to this particular text. Maybe we go online, but probably we don't want to do that just yet. We might want to do some things that are just very basic to help understand this Bible passage. Without even opening a commentary, let's say, how would you go about making sure that you understand the basic flow of this text? What would you say you could do before going to a commentary? What would you do? Pray. What's that? Pray. You would pray. Exactly right. You would go to the Lord and you would ask for the Lord to give us understanding. You would pray for the illumination of the Holy Spirit. By the way, that's why we pray for the illumination and help of the Spirit before we have every single sermon on Sunday. You notice that at the end of the Lord's or the, or the end of the pastoral prayer, before the Lord's prayer, usually the, I'm asking the Lord to give us some comprehension of the text. So we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. This is a spiritual endeavor. Okay, this is not a, a science, it's a spiritual engagement here. So, okay, we've prayed. What else can we do to help understand this text? David, what do you do? Can I pick on you? How do you, how do you try to grapple with the meaning of the text? Um, I read it multiple times. Reading it multiple times? Uh, sometimes read what comes before and after. Okay, read a little context before and after, good. Sure. Other passages that correspond. Do you ever make an outline of the passage that you're working on? Even if it comes into the sermon or not, you still kind of outline the passage? Good. Outlining is a great way to understand the flow and the connections. You can take notes on things. And then if you still feel like you don't have a hold on what the, the main idea of the passage is, then just repeat that process until you feel like you're beginning to understand some kind of assimilation of the basic construct. You don't have to understand all the details yet. You may never. But you want to understand the basic flow of it, outlining, reading, maybe using some commentaries, but we definitely want to understand the text. Now, the next thing that I would do if I was teaching this particular lesson is I would try to come up with a big idea. What is the main thing? I'm going to try to reduce the complicated down to the simple because that's what exposition is. You're exposing what's in the text by saying things in ways that are true according to the scriptures, but in summary form for the sake of the audience, okay? So if I can reduce it down to one sentence, I'm going to try to do that, okay? I don't need a sermon with 100 points because my audience probably isn't going to hear 100 points, but I do need one main gravitational thrust, one central concept that holds this whole message together. What is the idea? So again, let's look at Isaiah chapter 6, just for the sake of argument here. If you had to reduce this whole paragraph, verses 1 to 7, down to one idea, what is this text trying to say? Integrity? Integrity? Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Yeah, you could definitely you could definitely take off of that. That's great. How about another one? Anyone else have another idea? Bill? God is holy, and unless he acts, we are not. Okay, great. Um, God is holy, I think, is where probably I would ground this text to. I think that line, holy, 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 right there in the middle, the trice hagion, is probably the central core of the text. But you could do a lot of different things with this. This could be a message about calling, for instance, because this is also Isaiah's calling scene. Okay? I could do a message on angels. I don't think angels are the main part of the text, but I think I could certainly ground a message on the ministry of angels, for instance. David, what would you do? What, what would be your central idea here if you had Isaiah 1 to 6? Uh, probably the holiness of God. The holiness of God? Yeah, yeah. So even as we're suggesting ideas here, one of the things that we're noticing is that you could take a text and have different thrusts 
in different times. David and I, if we preached the same passage, I guarantee we'd come up with different sermons, okay? Um, we might see different emphases in the text. I think we would hopefully try to draw the same main themes from any given text, given what we talked about last time with our understanding of biblical interpretation. But we would come up with different outlines, different illustrations, different main points. And so that's one of the things that we realize is that um, the, the scriptures are so rich and deep that you could do a lot of different things, even very faithfully, with the same text. Okay? So we just gave four or five different ideas that would all be faithful to this one text. But I do think that probably if we really, really read this, we would see kind of the holiness of God as that central pin that holds all the other ideas together. It explains the angels. It explains why Isaiah says, woe is me. And it, it, it certainly seems to capture the main thrust of this text. Now, after I've decided what the main idea is, now the rubber is going to have to hit the road here as far as message building. We're going to try to build a message off of this text. And here, again, I have multiple different options. I could go about this a bunch of different ways. Here are three ways that we can build a message. The first would be what we call verse-by-verse verse exposition. Verse-by-verse, verse, it's right in the name, okay? You're saying first, let's look at verse 1. Now, let's look at verse 2. Next, let's go to verse 3. You may skip a verse. Let's go to verse 7 now. But verse-by-verse verse exposition basically takes the text and takes each verse and makes it into the peg of a ladder, and you climb up that ladder verse-by-verse. Verse. That's all it is. It's brilliance. It stays faithful to the Bible. Uh, it's tried and true. It's age-old way to do biblical exposition. If you do verse-by-verse, verse, you're probably going to be forced to stay right with that passage, which is one of the reasons it's commended. It's not the only way, because you could also do a message that is thematic, or topical, okay? What's the difference between verse by verse and a topical or thematic sermon? Anything different? Probably find other examples within the Bible. Yes, exactly right, exactly right. If you find yourself listening to a sermon in which the, uh, the, which the preacher is telling you, go to Genesis, now go to Ezra, now go to Nehemiah, now go to Revelation, you, you probably found yourself in a topical sermon because what he's doing is he's taking one idea and he's tracing it through the Bible, okay? Now, we could do this, certainly with Isaiah 6, 1 to 7, because we could take holiness and follow that theme all the way. We could go in Leviticus, we could go in Revelation, we could go in Hebrews. We might take a topical message and do something on the seraphim and just look at all the places in the Bible where the seraphim show up. Actually, there's only one. It's this one. It would be a short topical message, but we could look at angels and look at the cherubim too, draw them in. Or here's another way. We could do a doctrinal message, which attempts to reduce the scriptures to its main doctrinal teaching here, which again could be calling, could be the holiness of God, could be the purpose of angels, uh, or, or some other doctrine that we're looking for. Maybe we want to connect it to something that the Westminster Confession of Faith says or something like that. So there's a bunch of different ways to choose to organize your message, but you do have to pick one of them probably, otherwise your message is going to be scattered. You can't really do them all. You kind of have to pick which direction are we going to go. We're going to go north, south, east, or west, but I can't do all four at the same time. Okay? So choose the one that feels most comfortable to you. Um, so the next thing we're going to do, which I think is very important, this is a communication technique, is uh, I'm going to come up with a thesis statement that's going to be something that I'm going to use to communicate now to the audience. A, a, a lot of preachers skip this, and I think it's ill-advised. Your thesis statement is usually a, a one or two sentence moment in the sermon in which you are telling the audience what you're going to tell them, okay? If you've listened to five Matt Everhard sermons, you probably have already noticed that about seven minutes in, I say something to the effect of, here are my, my three points for today. Or, the main idea that I want to convey today is dot, dot, dot. And that helps in two regards to have a thesis statement. First, it, it helps you to stay on track. Because you, now you've got to be faithful to what you said you were going to do. But what's the benefit to the audience of giving them a thesis statement? They know what to be listening for. Exactly right. So especially if you're telling them what's coming, they might even begin to organize their notes section. If they bring a notebook, 
or if they use that blank space in the bulletin, they may say, oh, here's the three points. I'm going to go ahead and like patch that out right now. And now as they're a listener, instead of just being batted around by the sea, wondering where we are going here today, they're going to know, oh, I should be expecting to hear point two soon. And then when he says point three, I know I've got a few more minutes and then probably the conclusion is going to come. Okay. So this helps, uh, it helps keep you focused. Again, you want your thesis statement to be more like a laser beam than a, than a shotgun. A shotgun just blasts stuff out there everywhere. We've all probably been in sermons before where you have no idea where the speaker's going, and probably he doesn't either, okay? Because if you're here in a sermon and you're like, what is going on here? I guarantee in his mind he doesn't know either. He's just hanging on for dear life. He's like that guy riding a bull. You ever see one of those bull riding machines? He's just going to hang on until he falls off, and then the sermon's over. But that's usually not a great sermon, is it? Usually, usually you walk away. What's that? Yeah, that's, that's true. I, for me, a good test is, like, if I know if my sermons made sense, is when I go to the lunch table and I ask my girls, what did I say? If they can give me back the main idea, I'm like, all right, good communication. If they look at each other like they don't know, then that's probably that I, I wasn't as clear as I wanted to be. So even if you don't say your thesis statement, well, you probably should state it. Uh, even if you don't say, no, this is the thesis statement, you should still give it because it helps you and the audience to stay on track. So let's throw this out here just for the sake of argument. A good thesis statement for our text would be to outline it, actually kind of similar to what David said a minute ago, what Isaiah saw, what Isaiah heard, and what Isaiah felt. Now that's a pretty good thesis statement, okay, because... Each one of those is a perception, seeing with the eyes, hearing with the ears, feeling to the touch. And the audience is like, yeah, well, that makes sense, right? See, hear, touch, I, I get that, that makes sense. But notice, it's not, not at all a stretch to derive that from the text, because that's the way this passage is actually ordered. In the, in the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne. So your first point is, what did he see? Well, he saw glory. He saw glory. The next section, what he heard, verse 3, the seraphim calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And then what he felt. What did he feel, by the way? What's that? He felt the coal on his lips. That's exactly right. And we might even say he felt the foundations of the threshold shook. Maybe we could say he heard that too. But he definitely felt the burning coal. So that's a pretty good outline. It's not the only way you could do this text. Uh, we could do three points. Point number one, God is holy. Point number two, God is holy. Point number three, God is holy. I think that'd be faithful too, but I kind of like this one a little bit better. Okay, now, here comes uh, the real construction of the message. We've got our basic trajectory. We've got our thesis statement in place. Now, here's how we build our points, okay? Here's how we're going to build the points of the message so that they're co coherent. First, Read the verse, okay? You read it at the beginning when you started preaching, right? Keep pointing people back to the Bible. Keep pointing people back to the Bible. Next, you're going to explain it. Third, you're going to try to apply it. And then last, you're going to illustrate it. And you do that for each one of your main points. It's just a little algorithm. Verse, explanation, application, illustration. You with me? Bill calling on you. What is the difference between application and illustration? What, what's the difference there? How we should, knowing this, how should we behave? Yes, yes. Application calls for some kind of response from the hearer. And the illustration is how that might look. Yeah, really like. right, exactly, exactly. Uh, so in Isaiah's case, you know, he sees the glory of God and he has this tremendous experience of God's overwhelming glory. You might apply that by saying something to the effect of, are you likewise overcome by the goodness and, and, and grandeur and majesty of God? An application can be in the form of a question. You're asking something of them. And then to illustrate it, you know, maybe you tell some kind of a story or an anecdote that helps to bring that into the understanding of, of the hearer. Now, you're going you're gonna to do that three times. If you have a three-point message, verse, explanation, application, illustration, repeat that, 
If you have two points, you only have to do it twice. If you have three points, you're going to go through that algorithm three times. And in that way, the hearer is going to understand this text from a couple of different angles, right? Because first, they're seeing it in words, the biblical. Then they're going to have it explained in, in modern terminology, not jargon, but just modern communication. Then you're going to strike to the heart. You're trying to hit them here. So they're like, whoa, this applies to me. And then, of course, hopefully you want to also illustrate it so they have an outside of themselves understanding of, of what's being explained here too. Okay? So if I tell a story about Pastor David, uh, maybe they might help understand that point. But to apply it, I have to hit them in the heart. Now, I could, okay, do you think I could reorder these a little bit? Yes, yes, you can. This does not have to be watertight, okay? Um, I could switch the application and the illustration. I could do a little bit more explanation in one point than the other. I could have a point that I don't illustrate at all because my application was clear enough. Sometimes each point, you're just going to work through it organically. You don't have to make this into a machine that this is the only way to do this, okay? Now, Let's talk a little bit about the explanation part because this is, a, this is where uh, we want to be sure we're faithful to the Bible. Okay? We don't want to skip right to a great Spurgeon story before I've actually explained the text. So what am I looking for when I'm actually looking at the verses? Well, a couple of things are highlighted here. First, any kind of time or context marker helping me to know where this happens in the Bible not just what page we're on, but where in the redemption history of, of, of God's great story does this take place? Is this from the Sermon on the Mount? Is this in Paul's journeys? What, what are we talking about here? Well, it turns out that there's a time marker right here in verse 1. So I might want to analyze that. In the year that King Uzziah died. All right, question. Do I need to explain who King Uzziah is? Do I need to do that? Not necessarily. In fact, if I spend a lot of time on King Uzziah, I might have less time to talk about the holiness of God, which is what I really want to get to. Okay? So I have to decide. This detail may be helpful. Is it gravitational, pulling me in, though? Well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Maybe I'd rather get to the seraphim, okay? and I don't want to spend too much on King Uzziah. But it might be helpful for me to at least frame this up so that I can say, now Isaiah's a prophet, and he prophesied during the time of King Uzziah. He's one of the kings, dot, dot, dot. Give a little bit of chronology so that they understand this is Old Testament, not New Testament. Okay? So there's a context marker. We're looking certainly for themes. We've already talked about that. David mentioned earlier that to understand the text, we might look for other places in the Bible that relate to this particular setting here. It just so happens that I think there's a pretty direct rev- uh, reference in John 12. Okay, to this text, and also one in Revelation 4. So I might want to draw in other passages. David, picking on you again here because you're a very good preacher. What is the strengths and weaknesses, though, of going to other Bible passages in the middle of my sermon? Is that good, bad, or can it be both? Uh, well, it's very easy sometimes to get distracted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or to avoid the hard things in the main text. Yeah, yeah. Go somewhere else. Right, right. Uh, so staying focused is, is probably the hardest. Yeah, focus is really, really key because you definitely want to stay on that laser beam focus. Other texts pulling them in does sometimes elucidate the text to you and give you some very interesting illumination to see how that same phrase or concept is used elsewhere. So sometimes the light bulb goes off and you have an aha, like, oh, okay, I get that. But at other times, if you're, ta- if you're chasing all the way around the Bible and people are actually like lagging to keep up with you, then you've lost the audience by page flipping, which we want to make sure to avoid. Okay? Greek and Hebrew, uh, use that carefully unless you, you, th- you have some kind of skill in Greek and Hebrew languages or at least some very good software or some Bible reference helps. Don't try to pretend you're some expert in Aramaic if, in fact, you've never studied Aramaic. That's me. <laughs> Uh, certainly looking for keywords and things like that. That's all going to help in the explanation. Now, one thing we've not talked about yet, and that's on purpose. The introduction to the message. Now, a lot of novices, they're going to sit down with a blank sheet of paper, and the first thing they're going to do is try to rough out an introduction to the sermon. 
actually you don't want to do, do that quite early, they say, because you don't know what you're introducing until you have your main points. Okay, so a lot of the real pros, they'll tell you, do your, build your main body first, then come up with an introduction that's going to help the audience to kind of take off with the message itself. So we're going to do that. Now, how, what's the point of an introduction? Well, to grab the attention, of course, obviously. To engage the imagination, so it should be something kind of catchy or interesting. And also to win the trust of the audience. You know, the Greeks, going back to Aristotle's Art of Rhetoric, they would say that the introduction is pretty important because you're establishing credibility. Your first two minutes of speaking, people will judge you. Oh, this guy's boring, or this guy's arrogance, or this guy's kind of interesting. I think I'm going to give this a good listen. And people are very acute to making those early assessments about what kind of a speaker you're going to be. So the introduction is actually pretty important. Now, you want to hit it and then move on, though. Um, I, I, have a, I have one of the elders who will often remind me if my introductions are too long. <laughs> it's like, get into the text. Okay, yes. But introductions do have some service to the audience, though, because you do want to say something that just grabs their attention and pulls them in, okay? But you don't want to stay there too long. Types of introductions, because it is important. Personal anecdotes. Back in 87, I used to. Current events. Did you hear recently about Israel and Hamas? Problems or dilemmas. Uh, what does happen to those who die without hearing the gospel? That's an interesting introduction right there, actually. Some th sort of profound quote. Uh, Kierkegaard one time said, a little bit of humor. Uh, Cleveland Indians, Cleveland Browns, always, always go to Cleveland if you need a good... Hu Brown. Yeah, <laughs> I know, when you're in Pittsburgh. <laughs> if you want them to laugh, mention the Browns. You got them every time. Works like a charm. <laughs> Um, now, let's talk a little bit about illustrations. You do have to be careful with illustrations because I'm going to tell you the truth. People will remember your illustrations more than your exposition, and that can be a problem. You have to watch out. Sometimes illustrations are so good that people don't hear anything else. So you really have to make sure you're illustrating what you're talking about. I know a lot of preachers who will build a sermon out because they've got a good illustration. And they will hammer that illustration, and people will love it, but then there's no real Bible preaching happening. So you've got to be careful. Illustrations can be drawn from Scripture. If you've ever read any of Spurgeon's sermons, by the way, uh, he almost always just uses scriptural illustrations. If he's talking about pride, he'll give an example of Solomon. If he's talking about lust, he'll give an example of Joseph. You don't need to go out of the Bible necessarily to come up with good illustrations because actually you're reinforcing biblical teaching even as you go. Historical anecdotes are good. Anecdotes, uh, Christian history, I always find to be a very rich source of illustration. Your own life, one time I. What's the problem with personal illustrations, if there is one? I, I use them sometimes. What's What's the strengths and weaknesses? Dave Frenzel, any uh, strengths or weaknesses there? Well, I think it's uh, in your next slide, you're going to address yeah. the, uh, the risk of being the hero of your own story. Yeah. Don't do that right. Right. That, that is typically off-putting to the audience. If you tell a story about yourself, the best kind of stories are the journey story of how I learned something self-deprecating stories that are humorous about mistakes that you've made and how you've learned from them, struggles that you've personally experienced, pains, because people will deeply connect with pain. But you have to be very careful about the hero story because people find that generally off-putting. I, I used to have to listen to a preacher from time to time who would always tell hero stories in which he was always the good guy who went out and saved the the unsaved person on the street or whatever. And he's just like, oh, how many times can I listen to a story about how great this guy is? It's very annoying. Every once in a while in an, in an extreme situation, sure, go ahead and use one. Just be careful. Never, um, <laughs> I say never use people in the room. I will call on Tim Protos from time to time. There is the Tim Protos rule. <laughs> that, and he told me this, Nikki. He said that I can use him anytime. 
I know, there's so much material there, yeah. Uh, there, there are other people. What, what's that? He is definitely used to it. He, that's why it's the Tim Protoss role. What's even funny is that he often wasn't referenced by name, never knew it. Exactly. One of my children. There's only two, but you know which one it is. Um, one major, major rule, never, ever, ever, ever embarrass your wife, even if you have her permission. Do you know why? Because you'll always look like a jerk. So if you ever mention your wife or your husband, you, you never put them down because even if you've, like, can I tell that story about how you fell? And she says, oh, yeah, it's a really funny one. Everybody else will think, though, that you're cutting and you, you just don't want to come off, that you just lose your credibility that way. So you always want to speak well of uh, loved ones. And again, when I say never let the tail wag the dog, what I mean is that you shouldn't have an illustration that's so good that it actually overwhelms your main point. Okay? Let's try to finish up here. In terms of application, you are imploring the hearer to respond. Do this. Believe this. Stop that. There should be a moment in every sermon where you are calling that hearer to respond in some way. They're, they must be changed. Otherwise, why did you tell them all this? Sometimes the, the main application is repent and believe. In fact, that's one of the best applications there is. Or worship the Lord. It doesn't always have to be some sort of really clever application like go buy a, a journal and you know journal your thoughts for three weeks or something. I mean, a lot of times it's just believe this, look into your heart, stop doing that, okay? And then when you conclude, when you come to the point of the conclusion, this is where a lot of preachers go wrong, um, is you want to hit your conclusion and get out. You do not want to circle the landing five times because it really annoys the audience and it just delays the inevitable, right? You, once, once you've come to the conclusion, land the plane and get, it, get everybody off and then drive it home, Okay? So here's what, now the last slide, I think, right? Last slide. This is what a sample outline would look like for an imaginary message. You would have some kind of introduction. It would be brief and hopefully attractive to the hearer. Then you're going to give them your main idea next. Once you've introduced, you don't want to give the thesis first because you're, you're going to introduce the thesis. You're going to lead into that. Um, you're going to give your thesis, which is the main idea. Don't spoil everything. Just give them a clue. Just Throw some breadcrumbs on the path. Point, application, illustration. Point, application, illustration. Point, application, illustration. Sum it up, conclude, and get out. Okay? Now, again, this could be a 45-minute sermon. It could be an hour, depending on how thoroughly you do each one of these points. But you could also do this very, very briefly in just a couple of moments. Real quick story. Look at a text. One, two, three. Sum this up, we're done, okay? So if you choose to do the uh, devotion or the sermon for your class project, try to follow this example, even if it's not your main style. I just want you to try it just for the sake of uh, learning something. Any thoughts or uh, concluding ideas here? Any wrap-up, any, any corrections or notes on how to do this? Good? Kevin, any thoughts? Other Kevin? All right, great. Well, guys, that's it for today. Thank you so much, you guys. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right.